So let's talk about MRIs and multiple sclerosis, why we order them, what they're all about, and what information we can gather from them. So to start, we'll just talk about why we order them. The first reason is at diagnosis. Somebody comes in with new symptoms, we think they sound suspicious for multiple sclerosis, and we can order MRIs that give us information which could lead to making the diagnosis of MS. So they're very important in that regard. There's specific criteria, there's a certain size, shape, and location that we are looking for when we're looking for the lesions that we see on the MRIs. And that's very, very important. I like to look at them with patients because together I think it helps patients to understand why an MRI does or does not look consistent with MS. The second factor we are looking at is prognostic factors. So depending on the location of the lesions, depending on other qualities like are there T1 hypo intensities, which we will look at together, um, are, there, are there lesions in the spinal cord, are there multiple enhancing lesions, is there brain shrinkage, which we call atrophy. These are all factors we look at that help to give us an idea about how severe someone's MS might become over time. And the last one is monitoring. So for treatment, we like to make sure that it's working, obviously. And one of the ways we do that is by checking the MRI to ensure there are no new or enlarging lesions, and of course, sometimes no enhancing or active lesions. All of these are reasons why we get MRIs in MS. Over the past few years, you may have heard or read that contrast or gadolinium has become slightly controversial or at least questioned in the use of MRI in MS. The reason for that is there was a study completed that showed you do not get rid of 100% of the contrast material and that trace amounts could reside and remain in the linings of the brain. And so uh, there was obviously a question about what this could mean. Now we've been using contrast for decades and it has never been correlated with any adverse or negative outcomes. The overriding thought is that you can still use contrast but should do so with intention. So if you're going to use it, you should do so because it's going to give you specific information that can help you make a decision about your MS care or treatment. Another question that comes up frequently is why do we image the brain more than we image the spinal cord? Or do you need imaging of your spinal cord? And the answer is yes. MS attacks the central nervous system which is the diagram that you can see on this page. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The cervical spine or the neck, the thoracic spine or the back are other places where lesions might be hiding. So it's important to look for them, especially at diagnosis because once again, that can give you prognostic information. We get the MRI of the brain because on average, there are 10 spots or lesions for every symptom or relapse that a patient has. So it's much more useful to screen, even if somebody's feeling well. They might have disease activity or new lesions forming without knowing it. So it's important to look more frequently. That's different than the MRI of the spinal cord, where typically if somebody has a new lesion develop, they will have a symptom. So what's much more common in that case is someone will come in with new symptoms. We will think, hmm, that sounds like it could come from the spinal cord, and then we will order MRIs of the spinal cord. That's just a general bit about why you may get MRIs of the brain and do so more frequently than the spinal cord, but you also need to image the spinal cord intermittently. So let's talk about the most classic type of lesion that we look for in MS. The, here comes the nerdy part, T2 hyperintense lesion. And what that means is that when we get a T2 sequence on an MRI, which is just a technique for developing a picture or image, that we're looking for bright spots. So if we look at the picture that we have as an example, is showing what's called an axial or cross-section cut that goes through the brain at this angle. And the lesions that you see or bright spots are sort of oval or, or circular shaped. That size is very typical of MS. And then the location, you'll notice that right here in the center of the brain, those are the ventricles. And so lesions that are adjacent to those are called periventricular lesions, and that's one of the most classic locations in MS. It's one of the four locations that we look for from a diagnostic standpoint. You'll also note at some of the edges of the image here, there are juxtacortical lesions. The ribbony outer part of the brain is called the cortex, and so lesions adjacent to that are called juxtacortical. 
That's the second location that we look for in terms of making the diagnosis of MS. You need to have lesions in two of the four locations to meet the criteria for dissemination in space. On the right hand image, you'll see that this is a different view and it's called sagittal. So it's taking a view from the side, cutting through the brain like this. And the lesions are sort of spread out like so, and those have a classic name called Dawson's fingers. So if you showed this to med students, they would all tell you, ooh, I bet that patient has MS. If someone's MRI is missing these, um, they of course could still have MS, but this is a classic, classic appearance. Let's move to the lower part of the brain, the infratentorium. The first view was the supratentorium. So this consists of the brain stem and the cerebellum. The front section that you see here is the brain stem, and that consists of the pons, medulla, and midbrain. Lesions in this location have a worse prognostic factor. So that's something we take into account when we're picking disease modifying therapy, for instance. And if you look at the bridges or the peduncles, they're called, to the back of the brain, that's called the cerebellum. And that controls a lot of movement, coordination, balance, things like that. And so this area of the brain is critical. If there's lesions here, we may want to step up our game with disease modifying therapy. On the right side of this screen, you can see that there is the cervical spine image. So you can just catch the bottom of the brain, the brain stem and cerebellum, and it comes down to form the spinal cord in the neck. And this is the cervical spine. We talked about why the thoracic spine is important as well. I just didn't provide an example of that, but you can see the same type of lesion, the T2 hyperintensity that is about that size, it's about that shape, and this time it's just in the spinal cord rather than in the brain. Very important to note, it also carries a higher prognostic weight, and we want to know if patients have lesions here as well. The next type of lesion is contrast-enhancing lesions, and we mentioned that this is something you want to use when you are needing the information it provides. And what it is providing is saying that there is active disease at that time. So if there's a contrast enhancing lesion, it, it could amount to a relapse or new symptoms, but the disease is not controlled. Sometimes we use the analogy that there's a fire and we need to put that fire out, whether it be with steroids, disease modifying therapy, or other intervention. They give the contrast in, in, the, in the vein, so it should stay in the bloodstream. What happens when it leaks is that the immune system is revved up and it is crossing from the body or bloodstream into the brain or spinal cord. And as it crosses the blood-brain barrier, the contrast material can leak with it. And that's why it lights up the way it does in the MRI. So you can see that there are two lesions that appear more ring enhancing where the center part is dark. And there are a couple other spots that are slightly smaller but completely full of contrast. These are classic contrast appearing, contrast enhancing lesions. And there's also an image provided with the spinal cord where you can see that lesions can enhance there as well. That happens when lesions form and are active. T1 hypointensities are sometimes referred to as black holes, which is describing what we see here in the image where instead of a bright spot, we're seeing a dark spot. This carries a heavier prognostic weight as well. So this is still technically a lesion, but it is not the T2 bright spot that we are typically talking about. It is a T1 dark spot or hypo intensity. So it's important to understand sort of what percent of your T2 lesions have this underneath them. So you can kind of pull the two images side by side and say, if I see 10 T2 lesions, how many of them have a T1 hypointensity? Is it just one of them? Is it none of them? Is it all of them? Which would carry a much worse, worse prognostic weight if it were indeed all of them. The last segment I want to talk about is brain atrophy or shrinkage. This occurs naturally with age, but it is oftentimes sped up with multiple sclerosis and it is not a good thing. It doesn't sound like a good thing and it's not. So here's an image where you can see on the left hand of the page an image at one point in time where the ventricles in the center of the brain are a certain size. And if you look to the image on the right, you can see that they have increased in size. The reason for that is that there's decreased brain material. The brain has shrunk. And so the fluid that's in those ventricles has filled that space. 
You can also see it on the edges of the brain, which are the folds of the cortex. Those are called the sulci. And you can see that the space in the sulci enlarges or gets bigger. And that's because the brain material around them is slowly shrinking away. This is very critical to know. It is very critical to try to prevent. And it also carries a worse prognostic weight. So it's something that we should be looking for as well. As always in MS, there's ongoing research into new MRI techniques, into quantitative computer programs that can look into how much the brain has shrunk, how big is it compared to peers, that can stack MRIs on top of each other to see has one lesion actually grown over time. There's lots of developments underway, seven Tesla MRIs. You may read or hear about lots of these. Many of them are not ready for use in day-to-day -day clinical practice but it is important to stay up to date and incorporate them into practice once they be become available.